Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Triple N Media. I am Dr. Nick Nickham. The cardiology seminars are brought to you by Triple N Media on our YouTube channel. We have more than 200 cardiology lectures, so you're welcome to watch them. And please do subscribe to our YouTube channel. I have a cardiology rotations manual, which has 175 pages of useful information to enhance your learning experience uh, on your cardiology rotations. I will tell you how you can get a free copy of this uh, at the end of this presentation. The feature presentation is uh, pregnancy and uh, heart disease. Uh, so let us begin with the feature presentation. Here is the overview of this uh, presentation. I'm going to be talking about recognizing pre-existing heart diseases during pregnancy and their hemodynamic effects uh, on the mother and uh, the heart, new cardiac symptoms during pregnancy, cardiovascular risk assessment, cardiac complications during pregnancy, management of uh, cardiac problems, delivery considerations, cardiac medications, cardiac medicines, special situations like mitral stenosis, aortic stenosis, uh, atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, coarctation of aorta, morphans, cardiomyopathy, and much more. One to three percent of the pregnant women, one to three percent of the pregnant women have heart disease. Heart failure is the predominant form of presentation which accounts for 12.3% of the cardiac problems seen in pregnant women. It also includes pulmonary edema. Next in line is the cardiac arrhythmias, which account for 6% of the cardiac uh, presentations, and thromboembolism, approximately 2%, and angina, which is exceedingly rare, accounts for 1.4% of the cardiac cases, and that is followed by hypoxia and infective, <coughs> infective endocarditis. The overall maternal mortality rate is 2.7%. However, it varies vastly depending upon pre-existing cardiac disease, the risk, uh, the degree of uh, functional uh, impairment and uh, coexisting conditions. Stillbirth and spontaneous abortion rate was 7.7% in the cardiac population in pregnant women. Now, I talked about some of the conditions that are seen. Now, let's look at some of the structural problems we see in patients with uh, in patients uh, who are undergoing pregnancy. Congenital forms of heart disease include atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, pulmonic stenosis, coarctation of aorta, and these are non cyanotic type of uh, heart conditions. And if you're looking at the cyanotic type, it will be corrected tetralogy of fellow or Isingmenger syndrome. In different parts of the world, different diseases sort of dominate and if you are in India or other Eastern countries, India or other Southeast, Southeast Asian countries, we may be seeing predominantly rheumatic valvular heart disease, namely mitral stenosis, aortic stenosis, mitral regurgitation or aortic regurgitation. Heart failure is the predominant mode in which these patients uh, present with symptoms and there could also be some evidence there could also be cardiomyopathies related to idiopathic etiology or uh, related to postpartum cardiomyopathy during the previous uh, pregnancy. As I said, ischemic heart disease is extremely rare, but it is still seen in pregnant women, especially if they have diabetes and hyperlipidemia. The cardiac arrhythmias, the most predominant are 
atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter and they usually occur in the uh, in the presence of other conditions like valvular heart disease or atrial septal defect and the rarely do we come across conduction disturbances pyrotoxicosis and hypertension or other things we need to be concerned about uh, when we are dealing with the pregnant women he hemodynamic changes during pregnancy there are a lot of things that happen during pregnancy in pregnancy because of increased blood flow to the uterus uh, there is increased vasomotor increased vascular capacitance and because of the increased demand created by the fetus uh, there is increase in cardiac output so the plasma volume goes up by 40 percent cardiac output goes up by almost 43 percent heart rate goes up by 17 percent mean arterial pressure goes up by about four percent stroke volume by 27 percent while the systemic vascular resistance and pulmonary vascular resistance drop by 21 and 34 percent respectively if you look at this from a time frame from the perspective of time frame like the first semester the second semester the third the first trimester the second trimester the third trimester and postpartum it makes a lot of sense because during the first trimester the cardiac output blood volume and the heart rate uh, barely change while the glomerular filtration rate goes up right from the beginning of pregnancy similarly the mean arterial pressure and the total peripheral resistance begin to drop uh, with the onset of pregnancy the cardiac output goes up quite briskly during the first half of the second trimester and it reaches a flat top around the second around the middle of the third trimester similarly we see the blood volume which increases and it reaches a plateau towards the end of the second trimester and sort of peaks before the end of the third trimester and it drops in the postpartum period heart rate also increases during the second trimester and it continues to go up until the delivery time here's the stroke volume which goes up and it plateaus uh, during the middle of the second trimester and remains so until the end of pregnancy whereas the mean arterial pressure drops uh, during the first trimester and it comes down reaches the bottom during the middle of second trimester and it gradually comes up and it levels off and the interesting thing is uh, the total peripheral resistance or the systemic vascular resistance drops from the beginning of the pregnancy and it uh, sort of plateaus around the middle of the second trimester and then it returns almost four to six months uh, following the delivery of the baby so this helps us to get a better understanding of when is the cardiovascular system maximally taxed when do we see the maximum effect on the cardiovascular system and this has a bearing particularly in patients with uh, cardiomyopathy or patients with uh, mitral stenosis or aortic stenosis as this increase in cardiac output uh, increase in blood volume and redu reduction in peripheral resistance may have adverse effects on the functionality of those valves and can lead to worsening of symptoms especially the heart failure symptoms during labor the cardiac output increases by 15 percent with each contraction the blood pressure increases with each uterine contraction immediately after delivery the venous return increases dramatically due to the decompression of the inferior vena cava which causes the cardiac output to increase by almost 45 percent postpartum recovery 
the cardiovascular changes of pregnancy regress by about six weeks to six months following delivery as we saw in the previous uh, graph. There are other physiological changes that we can see during pregnancy which would include hypercoagulable state, hypoalbuminemia due to proteinuria, insulin resistance, increased red cell mass, increased sedimentation rate, it's also increased renal blood flow by almost 30 percent and of course increased hepatic clearance of medications because of increased renal blood flow and increased hepatic clearance of medications we may have to adjust the cardiac medicines based upon the effects now let's now let's look at how these hemodynamic changes are brought about. First of all, because of increased blood supply to the uterus to supply the baby with nutrients and nourishment and fluids, there is increased systemic vasodilatation. And along with that, there are some uteroplacental vascular circuit development, the increased vascular bed leads to decreased total peripheral resistance. This decrease in total peripheral resistance or the systemic vascular resistance uh, leads to decrease in mean arterial blood pressure. This decrease in mean arterial blood pressure uh, sets off the baroreceptors which send signals to the heart to increase the heart rate and increase the stroke volume. It also sends signals to the kidneys, uh, renin-angiotensin system. With the activation of the uh, renin-angiotensin system, there is retention of salt and water, which increases the blood volume. And there is also stimulation of the MSNA, that's the vascular smooth muscles, which increases the vascular capacitance which increases the vascular capacitance. So that is a quick overview of what triggers all these hemodynamic changes. The significant increase in stroke volume, increase in heart rate, reduction in peripheral resistance, they all have an adverse effect on patients with structural heart disease like aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, or atrial septal defect or ventricular septal defect. The critical periods during pregnancy start as early as six weeks. And if you look at the chart, we saw where the hemodynamic changes begin with the, during the first trimester. Maximum hemodynamic effects are seen around 30 to 32 weeks. That sort of correlates with the maximum cardiac output, increase in heart rate, reduction in blood pressure, reduction in peripheral resistance, and it is also seen during delivery, as I said, that with each contraction, the blood pressure and cardiac output go up. More changes are seen following delivery because of increased venous return. And during the second week of uh, preparium, symptoms during pregnancy, Symptoms are mostly related to the increase in volume, increase in cardiac output, increase in stroke volume. The symptoms may be related to breathlessness or weakness, edema, which is uh, uniformly seen in like 80% of the patients, syncope related to reduced venous return, because of the compression of the inferior vena cava, chest pain, which can be non-specific, or it may be related to increased heart rate and increased uh, cardiac output, nocturnal cough due to some pulmonary congestion, tachycardia, which I already explained, and splitting of the heart sounds because of increased volume going through these uh, right and the left heart circuits. We can hear a flow murmurs, systolic, 
and breast buoy, buoy and of course this displacement of the apex slightly towards the left. The most important thing we want to understand from this presentation is uh, the presence of uh, structural heart disease if any. Number two, what is the functional significance of that uh, structural heart disease like aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, whatever the condition may be and what kind of uh, symptoms it is producing. In other words, what is the New York Heart Association classification of the functional capacity of the pregnant uh, patient? And it is graded 1 to 4. So grade 1 is no limitation of physical activity. The patient is asymptomatic under normal activities like cooking, going shopping, watching movies or going to the mailbox the person would have no symptoms. They would be, for, more, for all practical purposes, like a normal person. You know, they can attend functions, have fun, all these things. On the other hand, grade four is where the, the pregnant person, pregnant lady is symptomatic at rest, getting short of breath, just walking from bedroom to the living room or to the kitchen, getting short of breath, just taking baths, things like that with severe limitation of physical activity. So in between these two, we have grade two, where the patient has symptoms with normal physical activity, like mild limitation of physical activity. May be able to get around the house, but to shop around the grocery store, it may be a task. Whereas grade three is where symptoms with less than normal activity the patient is comfortable at rest, but mark limitation of physical activities. That's like just not being able to even be work in the kitchen for any length of time. So this is important to understand because uh, the risk stratification is based on the anatomic uh, problems we see with the heart and the functional classification based on the symptoms. These two are very critical points to keep in mind and these points will come in handy again and again during this presentation. Now let's look at some of the clinical findings of heart disease in a pregnant lady. The pulse rate goes up which we already explained. The pulse volume is increased that leads to bounding pulse is persistent neck vein distension because of increased volume. We can hear a cervical venous hum. If you put a stethoscope right over the clavicle, we may hear a venous hum. And there may be a mammary suffle. That is, if you put the stethoscope on the breast, you can hear a sort of a to and fro murmur. Persistent splitting because of increased flow going through the cardiac circuit. <coughs> Again, due to increased volume and increased cardiac output and increased stroke volume, <coughs> we can get a systolic murmur, grade three over six. And sometimes yeah, the cardiology consult may be asked for the detection only because the obstetrician detected there was a significant murmur heard on auscultation. And this is your job to decipher whether this is a functional murmur or does this patient have aortic stenosis or mitral regurgitation and that is getting worse because of the pregnancy. Diastolic murmurs can also be heard like increased diastolic rumble at the apex because of increased flow going from the left atrium to the left ventricle. Cardiomegaly is seen but uh, generally the heart is minimally enlarged but you're not going to see a big heart unless the patient had previous history of valvular heart disease or cardiomyopathy and had cardiomegaly and we may be able to detect that sometimes they may not even know they had heart problem and that's when you examine them you find out they have a history of they have findings consistent with cardiomegaly. Edema 80% of the time which I mentioned these patients may have 
arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, PBCs, uh, and pulmonary hypertension, maybe either primary, like primary pulmonary hypertension, we, if it was not detected, it could be an important point to make note of it because it may have very significant adverse effects on pregnancy. The pulmonary hypertension may be secondary to left-sided problems like uh, heart failure re resulting from valvular heart disease or due to right due to left to right shunts and clubbing may be seen in patients with congenital cyanotic heart disease uh, who had corrections but the clubbing in, you know will remain if they had developed one now let's look at some of the lab tests that might help us to pinpoint what we are dealing with because quite often this may be the first time the patient is seeing a cardiologist and this may be the first time we are diagnosing this patient does have organic heart disease or structural heart disease and we need to know once we have established the structural heart disease we need to know what is the functional status of this patient okay low hemoglobin could be due to anemia elevated BNP is a sign of heart failure in pregnant women the BNP is usually normal or below normal and if you see a significantly elevated BNP like two three hundred or four hundred then you should seriously look at the possibilities of heart failure and look for what are the causes for heart failure EKG may show cardiac arrhythmias there may be some hypertrophy the hypertrophy may have been there before if the patient had cardiomegaly from uh, valvular heart disease or congenital heart disease and echocardiography is the key test that will sort of one pinpoint the diagnosis it will also pinpoint the heart function then we can combine that with the patient symptomatic patient symptomatology and come up with a composite picture of what is the structural heart disease we are dealing with what is the func function of the heart from an echocardiographic point of view what are the symptoms and under what risk category do these patients belong with the echocardiography we can accurately measure the valve size structure and function we can also look at the left ventricular function we can look at the the flow dynamics using the doppler studies and see whether these murmurs are functional or whether they are related to significant stenosis or valve leaks chest x-ray you rarely need to do chest x-ray but it may show cardiomegaly and some vascular congestion cardiac catheterization is not really needed but it can be done and in rare cases where the patient is having significant symptoms say for example with mitral stenosis valvotomy has been performed in patients who are pregnant valvotomy mitral valvotomy has been performed successfully in pregnant ladies MRI can be done as long as we do not use gadolinium because gadolinium is a teratogenic uh, agent and CT is not recommended because of excess radiation. One of the important things uh, we need to keep in mind as cardiologists is uh, the fact that when a patient is lying straight on the back, the inferior vena cava is compressed and if the person is lying flat on the back for several hours, the venous return is impaired there is venous stasis that leads to deep venous thrombosis which can lead to pulmonary embolus so it is very important to make sure that the pregnant person lies on the lateral side so the inferior vena cava is not compressed so there is easy flow of blood from the lower extremities towards the heart now let's risk stratify based upon all the things that I already talked about the structural fun the structure of the heart the symptomatology the functional classification 
and then re-stratify them. First, we're going to look at the structural part of the heart, like atrioceptal defect, ventricular septal defect, patent ductus arteriosus, mitral valve area greater than 2.0 centimeters square, which we can get by echocardiography, corrected tetralogy, which we can find out by echocardiography and the surgical reports. These fall into the low risk group. Now let's look at the high risk group. Patients with pulmonary hypertension, which can be established with uh, echocardiography and also can be confirmed with right heart catheterization with saturations. If the PA pressure is greater than 75% of the systemic uh, pressure, that's a pretty high risk candidate for pregnancy. Similarly, icing Menger syndrome is a high risk candidate for pregnancy. Aortic coarctation with valvular involvement and aortic dilatation again pose extra risk to a pregnant woman. Similarly, morphians with aortic involvement, dilated aortic root, all these are telltale signs of a high risk candidate for pregnancy. The risk is 25 to 50% mortality for the mother. The medium risk is uh, where we have mitral valve mitral stenosis, which is uh, less than two to less than two centimeters square, mitral stenosis with uh, atrial fibrillation, aortic stenosis, which is uh, between 1.5 to 2 centimeters square and uncorrected uh, tetralogy. So th this is uh, like looking at the anatomy, but uh, I already talked about the functional classification using New York Heart Association classification one to four. So we sort of, when we combine these two together, we can come up with a much better understanding of uh, what is the risk that we are dealing with. Asymptomatic aortic stenosis with a gradient less than it should be 40 millimeters of mercury, normal function has a low maternal and fetal risk. Similarly, aortic regurg or mitral regurg with New York heart class one or two with normal LV function is a low risk. Similarly, mitral valve prolapse with or without mitral regurgitation, but normal LV function. Mitral valve area greater than 1.5 centimeters, the gradient less than five millimeters without severe pulmonary hypertension, they all fall under low maternal risk and fetal risk. Let's look at the intermediate risk. This is uh, unrepaired or palliated cyanotic congenital heart disease, large left to right shunt, uncorrected coarctation, moderate mitral or aortic stenosis, prosthetic valves. Prosthetic valves are an intermediate risk because they are on blood thinners, especially mechanical prosthetic valves, they require warfarin. And when these patients are on warfarin, we have to maintain them on warfarin for a certain time, heparin or low molecular weight heparin for a certain duration, then we have to switch medications and those changes increase the risk. Similarly, severe pulmonic stenosis falls under the intermediate group and moderate decrease in left ventricular function, like less than 40% increases the risk. Of course, postpartum cardiomyopathy or peripartum cardiomyopathy with uh, residual ventricular dysfunction from previous uh, pregnancy. And the high risks are the ones which have a sort of a similar presentation. That is, they have the same structural heart disease like aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, but they have class three to four symptoms. So you can see the difference now. The intermediate group is the one which has a class one to two symptoms with structural heart disease and class three to four New York Heart Association classification with structural heart disease falls under high maternal and fetal risks. Pulmonary hypertension, which I already mentioned, and left ventricular ejection fraction less than 40%. So you are getting a picture as how to risk stratify these patients. First, we identify their anatomic uh, structural abnormality.
Of course, we haven't talked about coronary artery disease for which we may have to do like a provocative stress test. That's a different uh, uh, issue. But with valvular heart disease, congenital heart disease and shunts, we look at their anatomic abnormality, then combine that with the New York Heart Association classification and also some significant conditions like morphine, score rotation or pulmonary hypertension, we can come up with a risk score for these patients. So taking the, all the points I have talked about, uh, pregnancy is contraindicated in patients with Isingmenger syndrome, postpartum cardiomyopathy with residual LVF of uh, 35, less than 35%, dilated cardiomyopathy, pulmonary hypertension, which I talked about, if the pressure is 60 to 75% of the systemic pressure, and symptomatic aortic stenosis, severe mitral stenosis, morphans with aortic involvement, root dilatation of greater than 45 millimeters, chronic aortic dissection. These are all contraindications for pregnancy and that's where a team consultation with the cardiologist, the cardiac surgeon and the obstetrician becomes important in advising these patients as to the risk that is involved if they get pregnant. Poor prognostic indicators, heart failure or worsening symptoms of heart failure, ischemic syndrome, ischemic attack or acute coronary syndrome during pregnancy, arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response or VTAC, which VTAC is extremely rare, but it can happen due to a combination of factors. If a patient has acute coronary syndrome, electrolyte imbalances, yes, you can see PVCs and runs of VTAC and New York Heart Association classification three and four, which sticks out like a sore thumb when you are trying to satisfy these risk groups. Mitral valvaria, aortic valvaria, and all these things I talked about. I'm repeating a lot of these things so that it will kind of stick in your mind so that when you look at the patient, it, it kind of rings the bell more than once. Additional risk factors we should be concerned about are anemia which is part and parcel of uh, many pregnancies, infection, of course, hypertension, stress of labor, weight gain, multiple pregnancies, caffeine, alcohol, substance abuse, cardiac complications during pregnancy. The patient may be mildly symptomatic, like class one or class two. However, because of increased stress on the cardiovascular system during the second and third trimester of pregnancy, these patients' symptoms can get worse. Their symptoms of heart failure can go from class two to class four. That's when they are having severe symptoms or maybe even pulmonary edema if it is associated with cardiac arrhythmias. And that's where we really need to focus our attention. Worsening heart failure, and because of the mechanical valves, because of rheumatic heart, valvular heart disease, these patients are prone for developing endocarditis, which we need to keep in mind. If someone is running fever, low-grade fever, anemia, heart murmur, maybe a repeat echocardiogram may be in, in order to look for more problems related to the valves to explain the symptoms. Pulmonary edema can result in worse cases if this classification of symptoms are not very closely followed and appropriate steps taken to manage those symptoms. Pulmonary embolism, because of venous stasis, venous pooling in the lower extremities, there is a tendency for development of deep vein thrombosis, which can move to the lungs and cause pulmonary embolus. Rupture of an aneurysm is sort of a very rare condition. When it comes to management of a pregnant patient, one of the most important things we want to remember is tertiary centers for moderate to high risk patients. I already talked about who are the low risk group, who belong in the moderate and high risk group. Whenever you're dealing with the patients with 
moderate to high risk group they are best served at the tertiary center where they have all kinds of experts and equipment and facilities to handle complex cardiac patients during pregnancy. A complex cardiac team involves a cardiologist, an obstetrician, a primary care physician, a cardiovascular surgeon, a, a specialist, anesthesia, an anesthesia specialist, along with a nursing team to monitor these patients very closely and act upon appropriately when there are changes in the clinical uh, course. And of course, when we are seeing these patients for the first time, our first mission is to establish structural abnormality in the heart. Does this patient have mitral stenosis or aortic stenosis or atrial septal defect or ventricular septal defect? Or does this patient have coronary artery disease? What is the underlying cardiac problem? Is it morphans? Is it coarctation or cyanotic heart disease? So we need to establish the anatomic diagnosis. We need to assess the clinical significance of uh, their symptoms in terms of uh, New York Heart Association classification. So based on the anatomy and based on the functionality, we come up with a, a risk stratification as low, moderate, or high risk groups. Then these patients need to be meticulously followed and referred to the tertiary center as and when needed, probably more often than not. Because patients who are in the low risk group can very quickly go into moderate or high risk group depending upon their symptomatology. We need to monitor for early signs of decompensation. And if we can recognize that one, so even in the low risk group, if we identify those patients who are going from class two heart failure to class three or four heart failure, then we know we need to take appropriate steps and make necessary arrangements to get these patients to a tertiary center. Effective management depends upon pre, intra and postpartum hemodynamic changes that are constantly happening and evolving, which we need to be aware of. We can also do a fetal echocardiogram, which will be of interest to the obstetrician, the pediatrician and the mother. As far as we are concerned, we are focusing on their cardiovascular anatomy and functional classification and risk stratification. Medical management, of course, involves uh, minimizing the effect on the cardiovascular system. Diet, iron and vitamins are all addressed by the obstetrician. We need to focus on salt intake, which can be a major issue especially if the patient is retaining a lot of fluid, edema, and significant weight gain. Of course, avoiding all these uh, stimulants and toxic agents uh, must be an integral part of managing a pregnant person with a heart condition. We have to worry about interventions. As I said, a patient may be in a low risk cardiac group like atrial septal defect or mild mitral stenosis, but if they develop more symptoms, if they go into heart failure or pulmonary edema, we should be able to recognize it before they get into that state. That's why we need to be knowledgeable about using diuretics, beta blockers, digoxin, and anticoagulants. Surgical treatment has been done in certain patients, either with uh, using balloon valvuloplasty to relieve the mitral stenosis uh, effects on the cardiovascular system in a pregnant person. So to look at it from a different perspective, just as we do in the adult population, is this a patient with uh, acute coronary syndrome or coronary artery disease? They fall under the ischemic heart disease group. So we take pertinent history related to ischemic heart disease look for evidence of reversible myocardial ischemia and fix those problems before the patient wants to have a baby. Then we treat them according to the acute coronary syndrome protocols. 
If the patient has cardiomyopathy or heart failure or dilated heart, reduced ejection fraction, so now we are in the heart failure category. So these patients' uh, history needs to be different and we need to follow them very closely with medical management. And if the symptoms get worse or you can't control their symptoms and the classification of uh, uh, symptoms go from class two to class three or four, that's when they need to be moved to the tertiary center. Arrhythmias, so they are a totally different group of uh, problems. It could be atrial fibrillation, it could be atrial flutter, or it could be frequent PVCs. We need to find out the, the precipitating cause. More often than not, something is precipitating these arrhythmias. It could be infection, or it could be volume overload, it could be electrolyte imbalance, or it could be myocardial ischemia. So we need to address the underlying issue, then maybe use the anti-arrhythmic anti drugs, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, the cardiac drugs, so that uh, we can control their rhythm, more importantly, control the rate and symptoms. If it's hypertension or preeclampsia, then we follow the hypertensive route and manage their symptoms and blood pressure to minimize any complications. Okay, cardiac drugs. There are certain cardiac drugs which are safe and there are certain cardiac drugs which are contraindicated. For example, adenosine is a pretty safe drug, but adenosine is useful only in patients with paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. If they have a sudden onset of rapid heartbeat going 180 to 100, and if it is a PSVT, it may respond to adenosine. But if it's atrial flutter or fibrillation, it may slow the rate down for just a short brief period of time, then again the rate may pick up, but it may help us in diagnosing the underlying rhythm. Amiodarone, ACE inhibitors, ARBs are contraindicated in patients uh, who are having uh, pregnancy. Aspirin and clopidogrel are okay. Beta blockers should be used with caution because it can drop the heart rate in the mother and also in the fetus. Calcium channel blockers, nifedipine has been found to be pretty safe in pregnant women but deltazem has been shown to have some teratogenic effects. Digoxin is safe, flaconide is relatively safe, heparin is safe and has to be used, or low molecular weight heparin has to be used in patients who are on warfarin during certain periods uh, of the pregnancy. Hydralazine is safe, we don't need an extra S here. And furosemide is safe, but as I mentioned before, we closely need to monitor their volume as the volume depletion can cause significant symptoms of weakness, fatigue, and syncope. Lidocaine is safe. Metal dopa or Oldomet, the trade name, has been used for decades and is supposed to be very safe for monitoring, for controlling blood pressure. Procainamide is relatively safe and it can be used for patients with uh, ventricular arrhythmias if we cannot control their with uh, lidocaine. Propafirone, it is used for mostly supraventricular tachycardia like atrial flutter or fibrillation, but there's only limited data, so you probably want to avoid that unless you don't have any choice. Statins are contraindicated. Warfarin should be avoided between six to 12 weeks. That all depends upon different institutions and their protocols. Now let's talk about uh, prosthetic valves and the role of warfarin. Patients who have a prosthetic valve who are required to be on warfarin or blood thinner, then the maternal mortality in patients who are on warfarin is 0.9%. The incidence of thromboembolic events are 2.7%. Live births are 65%, which is kind of low. It ranges between 49 to 80% and some embryopathy seen in 2% of the patients. When we use heparin with warfarin, the maternal mortality goes up, thromboembolic events go up, live births improves to 80% and the embryopathy remains the same. Whereas low molecular weight heparin has also a slightly increased maternal mortality and thromboembolic events, but the live births go up 
quite significantly to 92%. So that's an important number to keep in mind. And there's no significant embryopathy reported in this particular group. And looking at this from a different perspective, when you just have a patient on warfarin, there is a 5% maternal risk and 39% fetal risk, whereas low molecular weight heparin has 16% maternal risk and 13% fetal risk, whereas low molecular weight heparin with warfarin has 16% and 23% and unfractionated heparin and warfarin has 16% and 34%. So when we are trying to bridge between vitamin, I'm sorry, bridge between warfarin and a short acting drug, the choice should be based upon these risk factors. As you can see, low molecular weight heparin has the lowest maternal and fetal risk compared to the other two options. That brings us to the question of how do we bridge patients with mechanical heart valves during pregnancy? In the first trimester, all right, if the person is baseline warfarin is less than five milligrams per day, you continue with warfarin uh, with close monitoring of INR, or you can switch them to dose adjusted low molecular weight heparin or dose adjusted unfractionated heparin. And so you have an option of any one of these three drugs. Whereas if the patient warfarin is greater than five milligrams per day, then you switch to low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. That is for the first trimester. In the next slide, we see during second and tri third trimesters, uh, the goal is to use uh, warfarin with the close monitoring of INR and aspirin 75 milligrams to 100 milligrams daily. And two weeks before the expected delivery date, you switch over to unfractionated heparin, maintaining a PTT of uh, twice the normal. So that is as far as the mechanical heart valves and pregnancy are concerned. Now let's talk about left to right shunts. You know, we, we have the atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect. These are pretty well tolerated, even with increased volumes uh, due to the pregnancy. But at the same time, we need to monitor for pulmonary congestion, edema, excess weight gain. We also need to monitor for deep venous thrombosis. In the presence of atrial septal defect, one more thing we need to be concerned about is paradoxical embolism or cryptic stroke because the blood clots can go from the right side through the atrial septal defect into the left atrium and cause cerebrovascular accident. Dilated cardiomyopathy. It is uh, seen between last three months of pregnancy up to the first six months postpartum. It is seen in women without any pre-existing cardiac dysfunction. It carries a 10 to 30% fetal mortality. Maternal mortality is approximately 9%. The main things we need to address are heart failure, pulmonary infarction, and arrhythmias. And these women should be counseled against uh, future pregnancies as there is a tendency for this uh, postpartum cardiomyopathy to get worse or have a recurrence. There are a whole host of uh, conditions that can contribute to the postpartum cardiomyopathy. You can just look through this preeclampsia, cesarean suction, multiparity, twin pregnancy, teenage drugs, all kinds of stuff, myocarditis, malnutrition, toxemia, smoking, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, all have been clumped into the potential, potential causes for postpartum cardiomyopathy. All right, mitral stenosis. Mild to moderate mitral stenosis is fairly tolerated by pregnant women. A severe mitral stenosis 
is considered high risk when the mitral valve area is less than 2.0 centimeters square. Of course, we do the echocardiogram to establish the diagnosis of mitral stenosis and the hemodynamic effects of mitral stenosis in terms of uh, elevated left atrial pressure, pulmonary hypertension, heart failure, all these things need to be taken into account in terms of assessing the risk uh, category. Then we need to monitor their symptoms very closely. If there are changes in the symptoms, we may have to repeat the echocardiogram to see if there has been changes in, in the valve's function or right heart pressures. These patients can be treated with beta blockers or digoxin for control of heart rate if they especially have atrial fibrillation or a flutter with rapid rate. And diuretics can be used in cases of volume overload. But again, when we use diuretics, we need to keep in mind the possibility of volume depletion. Okay, arrhythmias. The most frequently seen arrhythmias are, of course, atrial flutter or fibrillation and PVCs. Supraventricular tachycardia is very rare and uh, ventricular beats are also extremely rare. Electrical cardioversion has been safely performed in pregnant women. Digoxin and beta blockers are the mainstay in terms of controlling the rate in patients with uh, rapid ventricular response. And as I said, we should avoid amiodarone at all costs. Icing linger and pulmonary hypertension. These two are pretty dangerous uh, conditions for pregnancy. A recent review of 125 pregnancies showed that Isingmenger syndrome was associated with 36% maternal mortality, pulmonary hypertension with 30% mortality, and secondary pulmonary hypertension due to aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, left heart failure, and these patients had a 56% mortality. So there's a significant number to keep in mind when we are dealing with a patient and when we advise these patients about the future pregnancies. The overall neonatal mortality was around 13%. The preponderance of, a, the preponderance of complications occur at the term and during the first postpartum week. So keep that in mind. Coarctation of the aorta, we need to document the presence of coarctation of the aorta with uh, echocardiography or uh, MRI and we need to closely monitor their blood pressure and keep their blood pressure low so that we minimize the stress on the aorta. Severe pulmonary hypertension. It has the highest incidence of maternal mortality. Decrease in afterload after delivery. Hypovolemia due to blood loss. Hypoxia, syncope, or sudden death. All these things can cause worsening symptoms related to hyper, pulmonary hypertension. Maternal mortality is uh, around 25 to 30 percent, uh, and it invariably leads to right heart failure also higher incidence of a pulmonary embolism. <clears throat> Phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors and prostaglandins can be used to reduce pulmonary pressure, but if it's due to secondary pulmonary hypertension, if, if, if it's, if it's long-standing hypertension, the results may not be as ideal as you would like them to be. We need to avoid prolonged second stage of delivery and watch for deep venous thrombosis and try to take preventive steps. Morphan's syndrome. Proper diagnosis of Morphan's syndrome is very critical. Aortic root size and morphology should be determined using MRI and echocardiography. If the aortic size is greater than 45 millimeters of uh, 45, the aortic size is greater than 45 millimeters, pregnancy should be avoided due to the risk of uh, complications like rupture. Maternal mortality rate is 11% and patients with Marfan's syndrome must be treated optimally 
with beta blockers to control their blood pressure. And periodic echocardiography can be useful in trying to follow their uh, clinical course and look at the aortic size. Uh, aortic stenosis, which is mostly due to bicuspid aortic valve or rheumatic heart disease. There could be also mild to moderate aortic stenosis is uh, fairly tolerated by pregnant women. Echocardiography for anatomic diagnosis and functional evaluation. Uh, looking, look for aortic dilatation with bicuspid aortic valve. High risk patients are those who have aortic valve area of less than one centimeter square and a gradient of greater than 40 millimeters. So they fall in the high risk group and they should be referred to the tertiary center from the beginning. Surgery prior to pregnancy may be a lot less riskier than trying to deal with complications of aortic stenosis and heart failure. Surgical repair should also be considered in patients with aorta of greater than five centimeters. Blood loss and drop in afterload following delivery can lead to syncope in patients with aortic stenosis. And a close hemodynamic monitoring would be essential in preventing complications in the perioperative phase. Mitral stenosis, I have already said a whole lot of things about mitral stenosis. Mitral stenosis this is a typo here. Mitral stenosis is usually due to rheumatic uh, heart disease. Symptoms may get worse with increasing heart rate, atrial fibrillation, and volume overload. That's why I keep saying patients with mitral stenosis may be okay. Even with moderate stenosis, they may be okay initially, but as the pregnancy progresses with increased volume and increased stroke uh, output, there could be more symptoms and they can end up going from class 2 to class 3 or 4. That is something we really need to watch and atrial fibrillation can make things worse in a short period of time. Pulmonary edema is the most common complication that can result from mitral stenosis. That's why every effort should be made to watch for these potential complications especially starting off with atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. That may be the, the launch pair for the development of pulmonary edema. And an echocardiography should be done to assess the structural and functional significance. Well, watomy has been performed in patients during pregnancy for severe mitral stenosis. Beta blockers and digoxin can be used for controlling the rate in atrial fibrillation. Diuretics should be used with caution and avoid volume depletion. Prosthetic valves, I already talked about prosthetic valves and the prosthetic valves pose uh, two problems. Number one, they require warfarin and because these patients are on warfarin, they have bleeding complications and worsening heart failure because of the cardiac enlargement from the previous valve disease and a lot of these patients are on uh, mechanical valves because of their age and all these things add up. Coronary artery disease, I talked about categorizing them into coronary artery syndrome, coronary artery disease, heart failure, arrhythmias and hypertension. So we are coming talking, talking about ischemic heart disease. If the patient has a previous history of ischemic heart disease, or if the patient is a high risk with hypertension, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia at very young age, it may be worthwhile to study their heart and look for an evidence of reverse, reversible ischemia before they contemplate pregnancy. If there is evidence of ischemia, that needs to be addressed before the patient becomes uh, pregnant. We need to pay attention to drugs when you are treating these patients because uh, all these drugs do have side effects like the beta blockers and nitrates can reduce venous return and reduce the venous, uh, uh, reduce the right heart pressures which can lead to, to weakness and syncope. Risk stratification is also important and as I said aspirin and clopidogrel are okay in patients with uh, ischemic heart disease. Hypertension, there may be a pre-existing hypertension 
or it could be gestational hypertension or it could be a part of preeclampsia especially after 20 weeks of pregnancy if it is associated with other symptoms other findings of preeclampsia like albuminuria and others and there could be a white coat syndrome well now most of us don't wear white coat but uh, it can be because as soon as they see the doctor or hear the voice the blood pressure can go up blood pressure can go up for many reasons but uh, anyway we need to be able we should be able to control the blood pressure with medications and i have already talked about several medicines which can be used including methyl dopa nicotine beta blockers hydralazine diuretics so we have quite a number of choices to bring the blood pressure down and control them so that uh, these patients don't go into preeclampsia and have more problems arrhythmias i sort of touched upon this and i'm just going to emphasize atrial fibrillation is not good news especially in patients with valvular heart disease because they are already volume overloaded their system is already overburdened on top of that if we if the patient develops atrial fibrillation or flutter with rapid ventricular response the diastolic filling period decreases which leads to adverse effects on the hemodynamics and i talked about the drugs which we already know okay a couple of words about acute heart failure in patients during pregnancy if it's if the pregnancy is more than 23 months and the the infant the, the, the fetus has lung maturation then we need to look at and see what can be done to address this acute decompensation or acute heart failure if the fetus is not viable then a delivery and control of heart failure may be appropriate if the fetus is viable if the patient's wish maternal or fetal status dictates then we can deliver the baby and maximize heart failure treatment or continue the pregnancy and monitor the treatment based upon the clinical condition Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching this long-winded presentation on pregnancy and heart disease. Uh, I hope uh, I have covered more than what you actually need to know in terms of uh, one, evaluating cardiac uh, problems in patients during pregnancy, risk stratifying them, and determining when they need tertiary care and what you need to monitor in terms of their New York Heart Association classifications during the course of pregnancy and what drugs are safe in using patients with pregnancy. Thank you so much and we have more than 200 lectures on our uh, YouTube channel. You can watch them. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and this cardiology seminar has been brought to you by triple n media and if you'd like to get a copy of the cardiology rotations manual just send me an email to dr nick nickham at gmail.com it is in the description below and thank you so much for your attention i will see you in the next video